Seven o'clock. I'll entertain a motion. Open motion. Thank you. Motion made, seconded. All in favor? Aye. This is a meeting of the Christian Finance Committee, Wednesday, March thirteenth, two thousand and nineteen. And this uh, meeting is being audio and video recorded. The uh, first order we have uh, this evening is uh, Chief Gallagher with the Fire Department for an article review. Good evening. Good evening. We don't have a copy of the articles. We haven't written them yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> did I give you a list of the articles? Yes, you did. Yeah. Okay. Did, did you, you need you need to republish that? We'll remember the content. Uh, I'll, I'll, if you didn't save it, I'll bring. I'll get more copies of it. You got it right here. I think the last one I did was dated 3 5 or 3 6. 3, three 6. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So if you need more copies, I'll go make more copies. Posting more copies. I still have it on me. Okay. I don't know, sir. Would you like it? Okay. No. Okay. We can share. All right. As long as she's in staff. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, there are, well, there will be. Um, a few articles on behalf of the Fire and EMS Department that we're requesting uh, be placed on the warrant for the annual town meeting. Uh, the first is, is one that's not unfamiliar to you. Uh, it's for firefighter turnout equipment, uh, pants, helmet, boots, gloves, uh, coat. We have uh, been conducting a recruitment drive over the last few years. Um, we brought four firefighters on three years ago uh, and this year we're in the process of having three that in fact they're at the fire academy right now they go tuesday and thursday nights every other saturday from march until june uh, we are renting gear for them that seems to have been pretty cost effective for us in the past in fact your board receives the reserve fund transfers you'll be seeing that shortly <laughs> for the cost of the uh, the rental uh, we didn't calculate that into the fy19 budget um, for these recruits. So we rent the gear while they're in training so they can uh, beat it up and then simply return it to the vendor. But when they come out of their training in the end of June and for July 1st, we like to get them set in their turnout gear. Uh, so that cost is $11,700. My understanding is that that will come out of EMS revenue. In addition, I'm looking to replace the two uh, tough book laptops that are in the two ambulances. Uh, they are several years old now. Uh, the speed is uh, slow it's, it, it, on both of them. There's keys missing, there's screens that are cracked. They're tough, but they're not that tough. Uh, but it really is a, a speed issue now, necessarily unnecessary delays at the hospital. We use the laptops on every patient contact to document that. Uh, it then interfaces with our server and we use uh, the data there for billing purposes as well as, long, as, well as quality assurance and, and uh, other administrative tasks. So the cost for those two with a service plan, a three-year warranty is $9,500. Again, that will be coming from EMS revenue. Uh, the third article, uh, I don't have a price yet. Uh, Tanker One, which is a 1985 Chevy with a very big shiny tank on top of it which contains 1800 gallons of water is located out at station 2. 
uh, that rolls to any call that we have uh, outside the water district so that we go with that extra uh, amount of water. Uh, it has a leak. Uh, it, so if it's a 1985, we're talking 34 years old. Um, we've had it looked at locally by an uh, auto body uh, uh, repair facility and they were A, uncertain of the repairs that were, would be necessary, uh, narrowed it down but it wasn't going to be a home run and because of that wasn't able to even give us any kind of cost estimate. So we were very successful with uh, Greenwood fire apparatus for the ladder. Uh, when they took that, they were able to repair it cost effectively and efficiently. So the uh, tanker goes to Greenwood on Monday for a assessment of what the issue is, what the problem is with the tank, uh, in a roadmap on how to repair that. Hoping they come back and say that it's not that much money to repair. Um, we should be thinking of replacing at some point. Um, this hopefully will not be the year. We might be able to get away with just a, a repair and get some more years out of the tanker. Uh, it doesn't roll all that often, so it's not getting worn down, it's just getting old. Um, but we also have feelers out to other communities for used uh, tankers. Um, so I'll have a dollar figure for that. Um, Mr. Noble was the decision made if that was going to be That'll come from um, capital budget. Okay. And there's only so much I can take out of the yeah, reserve yeah, receipts. Um, so those are the, th the three articles that you have in front of you. I'm still working with Mr. Noble on a fourth. Uh, again, it's with our apparatus. Uh, I would like to be able to end my career knowing that all of our apparatus are in healthy shape uh, and hand over the keys to the to the next generation of leadership for the department uh, in a few years. And we have great success with the ladder. When it came in, we sent it to Greenwood. They went through and, and did a tremendous job servicing, identifying the areas, and then we invested money in getting those areas fixed. We've never done that with the other apparatus. Uh, and there's a punch list for each one of them that uh, needs to be addressed. The, the tanker has its own issues. Engine one, engine five, squad two. Uh, the, our youngest pumper is 12 years old. Uh, it has never gone back to the dealership for any kind of servicing. We do it in-house. Um, but we need to get grease into those grease fittings, and we need to uh, repack some of the valves and things of that sort. Again, it's not so much that they're riding down the street so, uh, every day getting beat up. It, they're just aging. So uh, I. What's challenging here with this article is until it gets to the dealership, we don't know what's wrong with it. Uh, we may need to replace brakes. I can tell you that two of them are going to need new tires, and not, the tires aren't cheap. So the goal, the plan was to take one of the trucks and get it done each year for the next three years. Um, in conversations with Mr. Noble, uh, we, we may be a little more creative with a funding source where we're able to take care and get that, get all three of them serviced and taken care of and brought up to par um, sooner than later. So that we then kind of reset the maintenance schedule uh, from that day forward and we've, we just kind of roll out uh, uh, care and maintenance of the, uh, the refurbished, if you will, vehicles. I would love to be able to tell you how much that's going to cost. Uh, I can ask these dealerships what we've identified. I've sent it to them again without looking at it, without seeing it, without taking the truck out of service. It's going to be uh, difficult for them to, to send the, uh, uh, an approximation. But working with Mr. Noble, we, we might have a plan on that and we'll present it to you uh, prior to town meeting. And that is it. That's all I have on the, the list of spending articles. <coughs> when the trucks are taken out of service, Chief, do you have uh, other apparatus available? Uh, no, we don't have any spare apparatus any longer. Uh, everything that we have is in service. Um, but we will do the same as we've always done, as the surrounding towns have done. Uh, notify them that we're down a tanker for a couple of days. Uh, we put Rochester on notice, Freetown on notice uh, 
even Fairhaven, they don't necessarily have a tanker, but they got a truck with a thousand gallons of water. So, you know, that would be of help. We do the same with them when their trucks are. So, uh, so you rely on a mutual aid agreement. Yes. Yeah, and we talk. We make sure everybody knows that your vehicle is down for a certain period of time, so there's no surprises. Quick question, Chief. Uh, on the Manning, is there a minimum or, or, or a maximum on your call firefighters that you have or you would like to have? On the when you say you, of you've got firefighters right now in the academy right. that call firefighters? Yep. Is there a, is there a uh, what, what, what's your manning stuff? So we're uh, presently have 32 call firefighters. Um, we fluctuated below 30, slightly above 30. Is that a good number? 30 is a good number. Yeah, uh, we've been preparing for the departure of uh, Jerry Bergeron, who recently retired, George Pimentel, who's gonna be retiring in a couple of months, hitting the age of 65. Uh, uh, Wayne Pimentel, uh, also from over here at Potting Ways, uh, he left with decades of service. So, in, in, in Donald Crocker, uh, another member who had 30 plus years on the department. So we we knew these this day was coming when that group that came on together would leave together. Right. So I started filling, bringing on newer members uh, a few years ago in anticipation of losing that experience. So to get them some time and experience under their belt too, so we can we can move around. But we have a whole new core of officers. Uh, the new generation is moving up. They're, they're pushing out us old guys. So what do you have right now for call firefighters? What was your total? Thirty-two. 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 Once these guys are out of the uh, complete academy. the academy, right? Now remember also we've also cross trained the full time <coughs> paramedics. So we have four now. Four full to all four slots are filled. All of them, are, all four of them, are certified firefighter one two by the state. Right. So we've got a we got a pretty good pool. Okay. It's a really good group. I got I got to tell you, I, I was just with them for a meeting, and it's uh, they're a very very good group of people. Well, my experience, I Chief, that retirement age is that an arbitrary uh, an arbitrary number? No, or um, the uh, sixty five retirement is mandatory for civil service. Personnel, the town, um, 20, maybe 22, 25 years ago, um, my predecessor established 65 as a mandatory age for uh, retirement age for call members as well, and uh, I've had to to pull the trigger on that with some very dear friends. It's amazing they get closer to 65, and I stay the same age every year. Uh, but it, it was a, it's been a, a difficult, it's been a bitter pill to swallow to to see talent and uh, experience leave. Um, but I feel comfortable with the with the younger folks. They're really stepping up and doing a very good job. So we're in good shape. Our insurance goes up after age 58. Then I better retire now. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to tell you that we're going to just charge you. Yeah. But you back charge the you back charge the individual. Yeah. User pays. Any other questions for the chief? You may also see on the list, uh, in just for purposes of full disclosure, there is an article uh, to remove the full-time firefighters from civil service. Uh, that will be sponsored by the union. Uh, and by the Board of Selectmen, my understanding, that's uh, come out from, come out of contract negotiations. Uh, it, the, the, some of you may be old enough to remember a battle that we had on town meeting floor decades ago over civil service and fire department, we fought to keep it in. Uh, the, what has changed is the nature of the job. Uh, where we, we need to be able to hire local people who know the department, know the town, uh, and who uh, are EMT basics at the very least and willing to become paramedics. That's the, that's the service that we're providing now. I don't want to be the first chief that hires somebody from out of town. Uh, and under the rules of civil service, if we, we have that open slot right now, if I were to call for the list, any firefighter in the Commonwealth who's been laid off has that first right of refusal. It could be from Ludlow or Springfield or wherever. And because we need paramedics, that makes the list even smaller. And it's been really picked through. At this point, uh, 
if, if any of your family members want a job where they can kind of control their own destiny, have them become a paramedic. There, there's very few for the number of jobs out there. And what we collectively have wanted to create from the town side of the table and the union side of the table is a pathway for our call firefighters. So establish a process where they're not <laughs> excluded. And right now they would be excluded because they're not on the civil service list, they're not paramedics. And they have this list above them for, for bumping rates. So uh, the decision was made and agreed to by the union and the town to go to town meeting and ask for all future hires uh, to be exempt from civil service. The incumbents would stay until we leave and the, uh, the new folks coming in would, could be hired through a process that's going to cost money. So we we are talking about the establishment of a assessment center, a private entity that we hire that's specifically trained, approved by the Department of Health uh, Human Resource Division from the state. They have a list of assessment centers that they uh, have qualified. We come down, do the selection process, throw the, the tests in front of the, uh, the candidates, rank them and then submit their names to, to me for ultimate hiring. But that will create that pathway for our call guys. We've got some great, wonderful, talented young folks who may be interested in a full-time career in their own hometown. So we want to make sure that they have first rights at those positions. So this is in, in the best interest of them in the department uh, to do this at this time. So. Uh, that will be uh, an article at town meeting. And we do have funding in the operation of the budget for an assessment center to uh, either hire a new or to promote from within, because the next promotion in the full-time ranks wouldn't be under civil service either. So we're still gonna keep it professional. We're gonna keep it at arm's length from the town by having a professional company come in and do the assessment rank the candidates, and then the same way that I would get the list from civil service of the top three, I'd get the list from the assess assessment center of the top three as well. So that's, a, that's, a, a, that's an important uh, new change for the department and for the town as well. But we definitely want to create and, and, and maintain that pathway. We all, every career firefighter in the town of Cushing at one time was a call firefighter for the town of Cushing. We want to continue that but under the present system, that may end. And we don't want that to happen. I think that's a great policy move, uh, Chief. What would protect, uh, would it be the union grievance procedure protecting uh, employees from arbitrary dismissal? Yes. It, yes. Is it strong enough, the grievance procedure, in order to... Uh, yep. The, the union uh, comes to the table knowing what they want to protect, this, the protections that they have under civil service, and they're looking to codify those into the contract moving forward, and the town's being very cooperative with them. You know, there's, there's no argument that the same level of arbitrary decision-making uh, that civil service would oversee, um, that processes be put into the contract to ensure that they would be overseen here as well. So having the two is redundant. You know, it's it always has been, to be honest with you. I know, but you know, the first bite of the apple is local through the union, and then you know, whoever doesn't win gets to go to the state for their final decision. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. Sounds good. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Thanks, Chief. Okay. Very good, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. I plan on staying to see what Mr. Menard has. Like that. Well, he didn't want to go first, so that tells me something. <laughs> yeah, you better be careful. Mr. Menard, next on the agenda. Welcome, Mr. Menard. Good evening. All right. Um, the, I got a couple articles. I got a couple for the highway and um, uh, a couple for, well, one for water and one for sewer, actually. So the first one is uh, a lift gate for the highway, and it's uh, um, the 
it's just for the back of a pickup and it's actually for helping us bring that uh, because currently now we get the the compactor pumps anything like generators anything that's heavy we got to manually throw them in you know we have two guys that lift them up and throw it in um, they used to have one on the trucks that we way back i think we had one right. um and my crew's getting a little older so i'm figuring to make it a little easier on them to get one of them some gates so they can use that for it's not that they're getting older <laughs> it's an <laughs> issue it's a safety yes it's a safety. safety it is correct i know i hurt my back doing that right. trying to pick up something for the uh, right hit the tailgate jump turn yeah. back down for a small price we can get you a lift gate thank you <laughs> so um and that the next one which is the lift from the garage and that's for lifting the, the pickups and one tons and this lift is enough to pick up our six wheelers it's not heavy enough to pick up our ten wheelers but the ten wheelers wouldn't be able to be lifted in the garage we don't get enough height in the garage anyways so and plus that when you get over these sixty thousands they get real costly for the for the uh, interior lift so this is, is that, not a drive is that the weight limit i'm sorry Six, 60, 16,000 pound yeah uh trucks most of them are probably around 12,000, so it's a little over what you, I'd rather have a little more than what, than a little less, and pushing it at that 12,000 pound limit. Um, they get a lot beefier, the pulleys, the cables, everything's a lot bigger and heavier, you know, so especially for a town that lasts us, you know, forever, you know. Is that a hydraulic, electric? Uh, hydraulic, correct, yeah. yeah. Lift two posts, um, and it's got um, arms, adjustable arms, so you can fit all different types of vehicles on it. Two posts or four posts? Two. Two posts. Is it two? Yeah. Uh, four posts, um, that's for the ones you drive on, which is easier for oil changes, but then when you get into brake jobs and stuff like that, you, you know what I mean? With the, the two posts, you can drive in there and you can lift them up and you get at your wheels and everything. So you can be able to do brake jobs and exhaust anything, you know, that make it a little easier. For two posts. And less room in the garage. It's easier to move with the trucks as well. Any questions on them two lifts? So, and again, that's another safety kind of issue because we're currently, you know, we've got a couple of ramps that we drive on, and sometimes the trucks you don't know, stop, and then and then using um, you know twenty ton jacks and everything to lift them up, and it's always a chance of them falling off of that type of equipment. Tough to get your fire trucks on that lift, though. Uh, yeah, fire trucks are a little heavy. No, no, oh, yeah, no, like no. But I mean, like I said, on other times, sometimes we have time to do it if there's other, other you know, vehicles in town. You know, I mean, we actually currently do the ACOs every once in a while. We'll service that, and maybe that's something we can integrate into a little more. You know, if my guys in the garage are doing it, I don't mind. You know, putting some other vehicles in there if we can, if it's if it's cost efficient. You want to talk on the road repair one? Yes, Mr. Please. Noble. Yeah. Oh, you want me to talk? Well, that's okay. okay. <laughs> that's the next, right? <laughs> one of the concerns I have: we commissioned a pavement management plan about a year ago to tell us what roads we should repair, what we should do to each road, in what order we should do it to keep the roads in the greatest repair for the least amount of money. The town basically takes all the money that we get in the chapter 90 money and commits it obviously to the road repair but it's really not enough and the cost of road repair has gone up faster than the state funding of road repair <clears throat> so one of the things i think we should look at to keep our investment in our roads is putting a little more money into road repair so we've got an article on the warrant in the capital budget for another 200 to 250,000 to supplement his regular road repair budget. The advantage of doing it as a, a capital item is it comes out of the capital budget and not out of the operating budget, number one. Number two, uh, it rolls from year to year until he closes the article, or we can supplement each year to that same article so that we can continue on identifying roads. The hardest thing that uh, Mr. Menard has to deal with is when we have a resident come in he complains about the condition of his road. We go to the road maintenance manual and say, oh, you're due in 2021. Um, and we've got a lot of the flood of these roads that if you looked at, that really need to be done sooner. So putting a little more money into them, save him. The other thing that we're coordinating with Mr. Bernard is that we're not going to open a road 
on Monday and on Tuesday dig it up again to put in water and sewer. So we're trying to coordinate our road repairs based upon our sewer and water repairs and upgrades. So that's also part of the whole plan. So try to do it in a little more cost effective, um, give him a little more budget to do it. He's demonstrated an ability to save money for the town by doing an awful lot of work in house. So this is a good way of getting the most we possibly can for the dollar investment we have. Much you agree with that? Very good. Yeah. Very good. Any questions on that? I don't know. I don't know. Quiet today. Um, the next one is for the water department, which is a, another pickup. That was the one we actually went for last year. I got another year on. I, I believe I gave you guys that the last time, right? The um, the trucks in the year. Yes, yeah, okay. the inventory list, yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's actually just to replace that truck. I believe that was truck 25, there's the number of it. Um, it's um, an old three. I don't get that one in front of me with the mileages and stuff on it, but that was to replace that one. And the last, but not and that would come out of water. Right? Correct, that's out of water revenue, yeah. Water surplus. And the next one is um, the I and I program this is what we've been this is actually just a continuation of what we've been doing um, it's kind of a DEP requirement and it's trying to find the infiltration through our sewer lines and we got um, I forgot how much portion done already you know the, the number that was done I know um, but when we first started they did the whole system in a whole and we what we were doing is because this INI is just now the camera work and stuff like that um, inspections, so they, they've been doing that and they've been the mains inspecting, so they got the cameras that walk down the pipes and give us, you know, full evaluation of it. So this is just another phase of it to finish out our uh, system. I don't know if it finishes it, this one or one more year we should have of this. <coughs> and then you start all over again. Right? Well, I don't know if we can get a year or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, you do it even, yeah. he does it every other year. But basically, by the time you get done with the cycle, it'll be time to start all over again. So, it's the full employment plan for our consultants. And basically, that's that for my articles. How about the sewer uh, school pump station? Uh, yeah. Okay, what was that one? I definitely I like it on my thing. I missed that. What did we put on that? 51, Article 51? Yeah. 51? Sewer Enterprise Fund for School Pump Station. Ah, that's really not his. That's the selectments. Oh. As oh, you, okay. We're not sure where we're going with that <laughs> at this particular moment. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put that one in obeyance for a little while. But the background is we transferred $100,000 from the sewer reserve to upgrade the sewer pump station at the schools, particularly because neighbors. Right. It not necessarily been ruled out yet, but it hasn't been exactly ruled in that we can actually add more uh, capacity, more um, business to that pump station. So consequently, if it's only servicing the school, then the Board of Selectmen is contemplating <coughs> repaying the sewer fund for the pump since it basically was only servicing the school. So we would take that as a transfer from free cash at some point put it back into the sewer reserve so at the moment I'm not sure what the status is I'd like the the uh, wooden current to rule out the fact that we could never use that for another neighborhood and if they can rule it out then the case is made if they can't rule it out then the case is not made that's right that'd be a big disappointment to the neighbors up there yeah well that's it's sewer right. area three or four yeah. so eventually it's going to be sewered but and, and, it, and there is ways around it. You know, yeah. it might be some we might be able to grab the feed, but we're gonna have to run another line to that existing pump station through the school. So we might even be able to get our homes in um, reservoir states and stuff like that. So it, it's not thrown out of the park yet. So like you said, we're kind of still working on that. And hopefully that follows some answers for you. But at this time, yeah, we're really kind of not looking to take it out. 
Also, um, while he's here, I want to say thank you. He's reformed the better roof repair or chimney repair at the schools. Um, chimney is in very bad shape, and um, Chris did, did tell me how bad shape it, it was. <laughs> Well, it still is. Still it still is still tomorrow. <laughs> and the cost of that repair was going to be staggering. And you didn't really have a choice. It had to be done. And Dan's fabricated the fix in-house. He's going to put it on in-house. So the savings was tremendous. So I, I, Excellent. I can't thank him enough for the ingenuity, the creativity, and the willingness to you know, do more than really is required. Dan's always given 110% of us. That's not just me, it's that my group's good. I actually heard Andrew has uh, been helping. He's a big help with that too. So it's not, it's a it's a team effort, not just one guy. So just want to say that. He's going to be using coordinator. He's going to be using ladder one, Mr. Chairman, to get that. <laughs> <laughs> that is I'll tell you, that's good training. That's good the training. concept of <laughs> one time. <-tom. laughs> it's everybody's problem, and the cooperation has been outstanding it's pretty evident as well yeah. so it's good all right guys thank you thank you very much Dan have a good evening thank you uh, the next item on the agenda is the town clerk Ms. Labonde I can take my car off now are you cold the heat kicked in oh See, but that amount was. Uh, <laughs> Save it on the heat. So. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me here this evening. We touched upon the need for new election equipment at the last finance committee meeting that I had attended. And uh, based on having the technician come out and make some repairs uh, just last week it, he did stress the importance that we really we've gotten more than our use out of these machines um, he was able to put some temporary fixes on two of them that should hold me over for the april election However, my main concern is if we hold off on purchasing the equipment and putting it on next year's um, town meeting warrant, we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, it will really put us behind um, because number one, any more repairs that need to be done, I can't be guaranteed to have them um, fixed. Um, the second issue is there is a very uh, strict timeline for when the election equipment is not only approved for funding, but it has to have a vote of the Board of Selectmen approximately six months before it's to be used in a state election. So we have found out that um, Super Tuesday is going to be May 3rd, uh, I'm sorry, March 3rd, me and my dates. <laughs> March 3rd of next year. Then we will have our April election, and then after that, we'll have the September and the November. So if we make the purchase this year, not only does it guarantee that we'll have equipment that will not fail us on election day um, for all of those elections, one of them being the, the presidential, uh, but it also, will give us the opportunity to have the appropriate training for all of the staff prior to the elections. So being able to use the new equipment for the lesser, um, the lesser utilized election would be better than, than trying to have it um, used for the, the presidential election. So uh, we have two companies in the state that have been approved uh, from the state elections division. Uh, what, both of them are very comparable in price. And the, the company that I would prefer to go with um, is ES&S, and that's who we currently use now for our Optech Eagle machines. Uh, they have made an offer that we would get two years, the first two years, 
of the maintenance agreement would be included in the purchase price, which we estimate um, based on my updated quotes of being $25,000 for four, uh, four machines, along with the new specialized ballot boxes that come with the diverters. And the diverters, what those do is they divert the ballot from the right ends into a separate, uh, separate container um, within within the box, and that's done to help minimize the work at the end of the night and make sure that all of the write-in ballots are accounted for properly. Okay, so um, the other price from LHS that I'm still waiting on. Uh, it was within about two thousand dollars in in total. Um, so, and I did check on the annual maintenance, and they are estimating that it would be just about it would be under eleven hundred dollars annually. <coughs> Currently, I'm paying almost nine hundred dollars annually for <coughs> the four machines that we have that that are not really up to par. How about the programming uh, <coughs> capabilities and? Costs of programming are they comparable as well? Yes. Yes, they 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 are. Um, there was just an article in the paper, just within the last few days, about paper ballots and electronic. We still utilize the paper ballots, um, and I have no intentions of trying to to switch over to anything electronic, except possibly poll books, which would help the check-in process. But that would be down down the road um, and that would really have nothing to do with this election equipment Any questions Mr. Bonte? Very good. okay and just as, just as a reminder that the machines have been on their way out for the last you know 10 or 11 years so it's not something that I, honestly, I really like the machines, other than the fact that they're too heavy. Um, but, but it's time. Okay. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, and could I make one other note, Brian, um, regarding town meeting? There will be an article on town meeting floor uh, requesting that the April annual town election be taken from a Monday and put on the um, on a Saturday instead. We're hoping that that will increase the voter turnout, and it will also be one day less that we'll have um, to worry about the children being in school and the teachers being in school during an election. So that will also be on the warrant as well. Are there any, been any studies uh, with regards to that, uh, having the election on a weekend as opposed to a weekday? Uh, not not through the, the, the town clerks association. No, it no. Has, we do have a number mm -hmm. of, of towns that do do it. Um, Middleborough, uh, a bridge, one of the Bridgewater uh, communities do. And statistically, I'm not, I'm not sure. You think moving it to a Tuesday would be more practical in the sense that people are in a habit of voting on a Tuesday? I find that people were even confusing on a Monday. They might probably be very confused about having on a Saturday, but Tuesday seems to be the day that you know we have national elections, state elections. Uh, whether that would be a consistent, uh, we'd like to move it to a time when school is not in session uh -huh. um, yeah. because it is a major effort to do it when the school is in session so i don't have other another enough places in town that are handicapped accessible and big enough to do voting by precinct so doing it the schools is the easiest uh, solution to solving that space issue but doing it on a school day is you know as we are going to witness on april 1st is a real struggle so we're trying to avoid any school day Going to a Saturday is the easiest way to increase our, our voter turnout in a town election, even though I admit to you, John, that most elections are Tuesdays and people are used to that. But a town election on a Monday that starts at 10 o'clock, 
just uh, I, com I agree completely. It but confounds I me. Yeah. Um, so if you move it to a Saturday when the schools are, you know, the AYSA is in play, so they might be out <clears throat> with their kids at the soccer field, and that may attract attendance to vote because they're right there on the campus. Um, most people, not all people, some people have Saturdays off, uh, and so that you're around town and being able to drop in and, and do a vote. Town elections, as you know, are shorter time periods than a national election. Mm -hmm. So if you did it to a Tuesday, you'd have to open up as early as we do for so we'd be consistent in the hours. If we go to a Saturday, you definitely know it's a town election, and hopefully we can increase the turnover and the turnover the turnout uh, as a requirement as a as a solution. Got to try something different because the Monday of a school week starting at 10 o'clock makes no sense. And from a perspective of town meeting is in May and the elections in April, so I could elect theoretically a new selectman in April and he's got to stand up and talk intelligently about town meeting articles a month later. That's a pretty good trick. So the idea would be to move the town election to after town meeting so that you would at least con conclude town meeting before there was a change in administration. Will there be any uh, thought of, uh, since you're moving it to a Saturday, I don't uh, you know, underscore the question about whether it, it enhances voter turnout or, or in some, with some people is it a hindrance uh, on a Saturday. Would you accompany that change with maybe early voting on, a, on the Friday or or, or the day prior to that during the week? The early voting right now has only been approved for the state elections. They are in the process of trying to change it. Uh, they tried to for the September election for primaries, but we don't have that, that flexibility. Um, right now, if someone wants to vote early, they would have to vote absentee which is still available for all, all elections. But the early, le the early voting is not an option at this time. Any other questions? Mr. St. Jean, just a real quick uh, note on the uh, Saturday elections. Um, I've been driving bus in Fall River uh, and just this Tuesday, um, they did um, an election, recall election, whatever, and um, getting in and out of that school was a total disaster. Between the parents dropping off their kids and the people going and voting there, that was in the morning and at night. So I have to totally agree with the school department and with Ms. Lamonti that it probably would be a lot better and who knows, uh, Saturday, during the week, I'm going to have a tough time coming to vote. Saturday, get it off. We no problem. And we'll be starting at 8 o'clock in the morning um, and going until 6 o'clock. I can't imagine anyone wanting to go out and vote at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. No. So <laughs> um, I think the, the hours of the 8 to 6 would be would be a, a much better time frame and even for the election staff to be leaving some nights I mean there are some nights where I don't get home till 3 a.m. Um, and it's a party. <laughs> no. but it, it I think it, it makes sense all the way around and just like anything else if we find that it doesn't work um, it's not set in stone. Um, we can go back to town meeting and we can change the, the bylaw again. Um, but if we don't try it, um, it, it's only causing more potential issues. Just a quick question. I'm curious, would that affect um, a cost? Is there, would the work schedule for the employees matter today? Would that be overtime, opening the school? people in the school is that, is that a uh... the people that work the elections are there for the most part they're temporary what we classify as temporary employees they're very similar to um, the the students that work the summer rec program or the golf maintenance program they only work a few select days out of the year so it would not 
um, entail anything as far as overtime, overtime right for them and the registrars it would be the same thing as far as the office staff um, it could mean a little bit more for the office staff because I would have to have someone manning town hall but we wouldn't be open to the public right so we wouldn't be doing the dog licenses and um, so I wouldn't need a full staff Who, who's required to be at the school to have the school open is there a minimum staff required no but we work uh, in this particular election where school is going to be open while we're doing election we are concerned about school security and we worked a, a committee um, police um, EMA town clerk me um, anybody I could find that was interested uh, to talk about how we're going to do the traffic flow, um, how we're going to have the police in the school, how we've got Jerry out on the sidewalk directing traffic. This is uh, for the Monday election. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious about if we were to move it to the Saturday. Oh yeah. We just we just we could we can secure that end of the building. Okay. Which is very similar to what we did um, during the last few elections when it was a professional day. The teachers were in school, um, but they were only in school for half the day. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Would that impact the school department cost in any, in any way, having it on a Saturday? It would be negligible, I would think, because we would probably call in a custodian to open the building and be on site for any custodial needs. But in the overall scheme of things, I don't think the cost would be that much, and it would be worth having it for us on a Saturday rather than, you know, trying to figure out how to make sure everybody can get exercise their right to vote, protect the children and the staff and all the traffic that's involved. So I think the cost would be fairly negligible and not something that would be, you know, a reason not to do it, certainly. We can work that out. I know the traffic's tough on, a, on just a normal day. Yeah. At, uh, during the school hours, uh, school dismissal. Does the Secretary of State's office have any recommendations on, on Saturday voting? Do they, do, you know, the election division, do they think it's uh, a positive or is it a negative aspect, you know? To be honest, I have not reached out to them. I've reached out to other communities that hold the election mm -hmm. on the Saturdays. Uh, and the town clerks that I have dealt with seem very satisfied with their annual town elections on those days. Any other comments, questions? That would be a bylaw change, is that? It would be a bylaw change, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. the information. <coughs> okay, we're doing good. We uh, entertain uh, Ms. Flynn before uh, Make your press short. Sure. Do you want to address the uh, the group? Uh? Um, no, I think what I uh, what we'd like to do is just come back to the finance committee, okay. and I believe we have an appointment in two weeks okay. to to update you on our school budget. I know when we met last Wednesday. Uh, we had said we had just become aware of some additional out of district tuitions, so we are just finalizing the impact of that for next year, so we would like to apprise the, the committee of that. Okay. And then maybe take any other questions that you may have come up with between last week and then. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noble. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of work tonight because it's getting a little closer to real budget time. Um, good news. We can pass this so along. Um, we got our Maya renewal for property and casualty and for workers' compensation. Um, John's going to have a fit, but I'm not standing with the microphone. So I'll come back over here. But I feel so far away. <laughs> John, can you follow the camera here? Can I move it forward a little bit? Um, so that's the first good news. The second good news is <clears throat> our health insurance is going to come in um, reasonable for a change. Uh, perhaps a slight decrease of 3%. So that's a plus factor. That's a 
good respite for a, a long time. So those are two things that are coming through. I want to give you a projection of where we are right now in the budget, and I don't want you to get too upset when you look at the deficit. <coughs> So if you look at the top uh, on the FY20 page, it shows a deficit right now of 827,000. Um, that includes the schools at the 3.5% that they've requested. Um, it also has not been adjusted for, for example, the old colony decrease in their assessment. So we're gonna, Julie and I will give you a uh, a better projection next week because we've been gathering up all the changes that we're going to put in that will just be <clears throat> things that are contractual or that have come in better like our insurance and our health insurance so we can just adjust those and then we're going to have to we'll still come down to a number that we're going to have to be a little painful in cutting but i think we can certainly get halfway down this list easily but then after that it gets a little little more difficult so we will come in with some ideas for you to consider and uh, then we're going to have to go through budget by budget and determine what we have the space and capacity for so at the moment let's take this under advisement for the uh, the, the time being next week when we're together we'll spend some time on going through the changes and making some recommendations on what you need to look at what i'd like to talk today about is the revenue projections Sorry, Kathy, I always forget what I call it is. revenue projections I think it's safe after looking at the governor's budget it's safe at the moment to project basically a level uh, receipts I don't believe we'll get any less than what we got last year uh, chapter 90 forecast is about the same as last year um, so I don't see any reason to make a change on that I was hoping a change in the educational formula was going to give us a little bit more money in chapter 70 not true not going to happen it certainly doesn't benefit us so <clears throat> we're not projecting any change in that. What we have been questioned, and the first item that I'm going to discuss is the motor vehicle excise revenue. Um, we had projected that pretty conservatively over the years at a million dollars. Um, we are being questioned by the Department of Revenue for perhaps estimating too low on that one. So we may have... Uh, we're, we're probably going to come back to you and change that forecast. The Department of Revenue said, nice try, do it again. So we will be adjusting that revenue number up. But I want to, again, still a little conservative. The world changes. Um, I'd rather have a forecast of less, live with less, and if we get more, great. If we get less, we don't get into trouble. So <clears throat> probably the only change I'm going to recommend in our forecast is in the motor vehicle excise tax increase that number somewhere around 200,000. So as you can see in the history back to 2012, the last time we got only close to a million was 2012. And then you can see it's been going up dramatically since as the economy has been improving. So <clears throat> last year was a new high at a million five and this year's forecast it's not going to be a million, I'm sure. I'm sure we're already at a, a million five. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be in the same neighborhood again. So obviously the Department of Revenue isn't letting me forecast a revenue number that's 30%, 33% off. So um, that's the only change I think we're going to make in the revenue numbers. So by the way, if I added 200,000 in motor vehicle excise, that deficit goes down to 627. So already I just saved you 200,000. So, good, but next week I think we're going to have to get into 
the nitty gritty of looking at the budget that's already presented to you to start to question where you might like to make the, the changes. And then, of course, we want to talk to the departments that would be affected by any change that we decide we want to make. So, questions? Too easy. Wage and classification. If we made any wage and classification, we've made progress. Wow. <laughs> uh, the board of selectmen has a proposal going before it next Tuesday. Uh, last Tuesday at the selectmen's meeting, one of my selectmen would not. Uh, able to stay because of emergency at home so the other two stayed and worked on the details without making a vote because they wanted to wait until all three were present so this coming Tuesday uh, we have a um, executive session scheduled to uh, approve the recommendations of the wage and classification so we will have real numbers hopefully by the next time we speak in, in the budget that we have presented to there are some line items that include the adjustments for the wage and classification. No, only no. for the, the, that is not quite no. true. Okay. The 2%, which was the COLA adopted by the Board of Selectmen, yeah. those have been included. Yep. There have been no adjustments for wage and step. So in other words, there'll be a minimum, in other words, under the wage and classification program, mm -hmm. you would get a minimum of the COLA, yep. but you might not get the step. Step is performance driven, mm -hmm. not that you stayed another year, you get another, you know, a, a, like a teacher's okay. contract has a classification and a step or a colon yep, and yep. a step. The non union employees, it's performance driven, so it's cola plus the performance. So you have to meet the performance standard. Okay, so I know I missed a few of the budget hearings. So when I see significant jumps in salaries, you're saying that's not tied to the wage and classification study that we did? Not. So let's talk about the big gorilla in the audience. We uh, changed the building commissioner's pay um, and we raised him $18,000 because we dumped on him the facilities management. Yep. You will recall that we lost an employee that was costing $60,000 and I've replaced that employee with an $18,000 change in Jim and changing his job description and his expectations. Yep. So I think we've done good. We're getting much more out of an employee that uh, is willing to do the job and does a great job. And there's not, and I can stand here and I will defend to my grave the fact that he earns his money and that if you look at the money that's come back from green communities uh, to the town and the money that comes back from the building commissioner fees, he doesn't cost the town a dime. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the building department? Correct. Okay. And so there's, right, so the bump up there and the drop is, the drop's where? The drop is in the maintenance budget, the maintenance salaries. In somebody else's budget? It's in the building maintenance budget. I'll have Julie point it out to you exactly. <laughs> okay. Because I'm looking at the building department budget and it's up 17%. So if there's a wash, the wash is not happening. Are you looking thinking. in the salaries or are you looking in the supplies? I'm looking in total. Okay, I'll, I'll get you the exact account and email you. Okay. But yeah, it's got to be someplace else. Cause it's not in, it's definitely, unless I don't know numbers. We lost Scott. We didn't replace him. Yeah, I, I remember that. So he's got to be in there. Yeah, somewhere. it's got to be somewhere. It's just not, not in these numbers. Right. I'll find out where Julie's put it. Okay. And maybe I'll flip through and see if I can find it. But okay, but there are some other budgets that have significant increases in salaries. Sure, in many cases, in some cases last year, the COLA wasn't decided upon at the time the budget was set. So sometimes you see instead of the 2%, you see 4%. Or 9%. Uh, give me the budget. Assessors. It's up 9%. I just um, assumed it was wage and classification. Wage? No, it's not wage and classification. The assessor's budget, that's a union contract. Do we settle the union contract with the ASME union? So that reflects that change. There's two changes that happened in the yeah. assessors, which uh, Sue was reclassified up, and she got the cost of living increase as, as uh, negotiated by the union. Uh, and of course, she gets a step because she's got another year. Okay. So you have reclassification. Yep. 
a step increase, and a COLA. And that's how you get to the nine. Correct. Shouldn't the wage and classifications uh, increases be an article? Since it can be an article. Since, it doesn't have to be an article. Right. But since the, uh, the town meeting had voted uh, for that study, therefore the increases would be the results of the study which they had voted on. Correct. It can be done that way. My, philosophically, it's not an ironclad rule. Philosophically, it's to be paid for out of recurring revenue sources. Correct. And I like the articles to be paid out of non-recurring revenue sources. Mm -hmm. So, for example, an operating expense like buying police cruisers, since we do it every year, that's an operating expense and therefore should be part of the operating budget. The purchase of maintenance for the fire truck is a one-time occurrence, so therefore it should come from one-time revenue. The wage and classification would be ongoing operating expenses, so I would tend to put that into the budget where it is known ahead of the time of the budget. But, for example, if I adopted a contract that had a retro component, then I would put the retro into the article for town meeting and the ongoing into the operating budget. That makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Second of all, you mentioned uh, a significant increase in one department. I don't want to get into. It. Sure. Shouldn't that that when it's a substantial increase that the town meeting vote should vote that in the line item budget as far as that much of an increase? Then um, there's a philosophical argument to be made, but it's not a requirement. And in this particular case, where the net effect is the savings. Well, to why isn't it not a requirement where it is the last year's budget yeah. specifically pointed out that was the salary for the year? But as you know, and salary was changed, but it was changed administratively. Correct. Without either a reserve fund transfer or a town meeting action. How, how could that increase be a legal one? Uh, because the actual operating budget of the town is still a net budget. A big part. The operating budget of the town is still a net budget. You voted X number of dollars for the appropriation of the running of the community. You'd have a problem. No, no, with that they voted line a, item budget and they voted they, that particular they loaned, salary. They, they voted salaries and they voted supplies, mm -hmm. the two lines on the, on the budget. But at the end of the year, as you know, in May and June, I can move money between the supplies and the salaries. But in that particular case, I'm moving from one salary line to another salary line. So salaries were voted in excess of the appropriate, the appropriation is in excess of the salaries. Because I lost an employee at 60,000 and I replaced him at 18,000, I didn't, I did not go above the appropriation for salaries. Mm -hmm. What precludes the, in a, in a recommendation, uh, that in the next budget that the Finance Committee recommend that that salary remain other than a cost of living of what it was as they originally appropriated? It depends on how it's voted. If you want to pull out every single no, I'm wage... Ju I'm just uh, just yeah. raising if you want to pull out every single wage and vote the wage... For example, I can't <coughs> give an elected officer more than it was voted at town meeting, no matter what. But I can, in the situation where I have a department budget of salaries, I can give one employee more than uh, cost of living raise. I'm taking this as, as, as a philosophical type of discussion when we're talking about... In a perfect world, if we were, for example, a town council as opposed to a town meeting, you'd take any change like that to the town council. But because you can't go to town meeting on the drop yeah. of a hat, you have a certain amount of latitude given to you under state law, as long as you don't exceed the total appropriation granted to the operation of the town, you're still legal. <coughs> I'm taking a, a philosophical question of separation of powers. Sure. And, and, and the integrity of a town meeting voting on a budget, and they voting on, uh, you know, appropriating money for certain purposes, and then administratively, it becomes a few months after it, that changes, 
And as you see, it's almost dealing with the, uh, the separation of powers between Congress and, and the President and the discussion on you know, a national emergency, which he <coughs> can clear and move the money around for something. And they're saying, no, we've appropriate, we put a budget together, and we've said that the, budget, the, the finances in that particular budget should be used for the purpose which the Congress had voted for. And I'm, I'm just saying, I'm saying it applies same thing to the town meeting structure, where separation of powers, uh, basically that's where you know the town meeting is our legislative branch, and they have voted monies for a certain purpose. And the question is whether administratively can that be changed? It can. It can. I, I question. I. I I'd, uh, I, I'd refer that question to the town council, in my, my estimation. I, I really would. Okay. <laughs> Good, be my guest. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, so unless we, uh, unless we make a motion, we ask the chairman to uh, refer that to town council, or is it made basic? Can you can you uh, can you do it for it's us? It's in the basic appropriation of Article of Chapter Forty One. If you want to look it up, I mean, you can see. Oh, no, no. And an, an under municipal modernization at the end of the year. I, in the old days, you could only move money from salary to salary. Now, in May and June, I can move any money from any line that you guys approve to cover a deficit in another line, whether it be salaries or supplies. The intent of the article or municipal modernization is to say that the town appropriated X number of dollars in town meeting for the administration of government of the town. And as long as you don't exceed the total appropriation as approved by town meeting, the legislature has said that's acceptable. It seems that the, that the towns have more, uh, the administration of towns have more power uh, in, uh, than, over the, uh, than the president does over his budget. Yeah, I can't make a comment on that. I don't, I don't, federal spending is, is a mystery to me. I know how town spending works, and I prefer to do it the way the school does. Give you one number. <laughs> that's not that's not the case right now. <laughs> <laughs> Any further question? That's on the chapter forty one of yeah. the, the revised. Right. Uh, and you want to look under the municipal modernization where we can move money between in the old days salary was salary and right. supplies were supplies and never the two shall meet. Now in May and June, we can move between supplies and salaries, salaries and supplies to balance the budget as long as we don't exceed the total appropriation of the town meeting. And that's why previous to that modernization, the finance yeah, committee would meet all the time. Con consistently to correct, you know, make right. those approve those transfers. Yep. Now it's basically a transfer when we, we need transfer from the finance reserve. That's when we, we, we need to do that. And at the end of the year. We'll come in and change some numbers to move salary where we need salary. And um, I try not to cross over between supplies and salary. It does happen. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks. That's all you have for us? That's all I got. Well, it's pretty easy when Julie's not here. To I was anticipating a little more. Intense, uh, next week, next week we make some decisions. We'll have some answers on um, some of our contractual obligations by that time, hopefully. We're still outstanding with the police, um, but I think we'll be hopefully closer with the fire, um, and then we're going to have to make some decisions about what we We're not going to be able to close the 827 without making some cuts, so some cuts will be on the table. That's when you're going to have cuts. Were always painful. Cuts are painful. Yep. But we don't really have all of, you know. And, and I'm not sure that there's an appetite for an override. I certainly wouldn't propose one. I think we live within the appropriate the the levy that we have and figure it out. I'm sure we will. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. We're at this point in budget. Uh, deliberations a couple of years ago and it was very painful and, uh, well,
that's the understatement of the uh, yeah. year so far. There's a lot of... Uh, one more question. Sure. Um, we'll probably have it next week. Your new growth figure. Yep. Uh, has it increased from last year? Um, it hasn't really taken effect. I mean, one of the things I'm watching the new growth number particularly for how accurate it is. Yes. Um, I'm just being very careful because I think the economy, this is just... Well, the building, I'm looking at... Yeah. We're getting a lot of building. We're seeing some more money coming in. I'm not sure how long term that is. And I think we all lived through 2008 when we took a sharp turn. Yes. And I'm just nervous about putting a foot on the ice not knowing it's 100%. Mm -hmm. One quick question. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I, I, the reason I was trying to follow up on that, you know, when I was thinking about uh, it seems that I'd like to, when we look at the budget, we should basically be looking at since there's a lot more building going on, and it seems to be having an impact on the budget this year, whether the, how we should use the new growth specifically to offset the cost of, 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 of additional uh, in the services needed for, for the, uh, for the uh, incre increasing, you know, increase, increase building. You know, right. schools are one. Probably, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the police fire. You know, sort of, sort of, cut that out of the budget so we can look at it and, uh, and apply a new growth figure uh, to offset those those costs. Well, new growth last year in the recap for nineteen, new growth was two hundred and twenty thousand, and right now our FY twenty projection, new growth will be one hundred and sixty thousand. That's a projection. So we are not predicting that the, the level of growth that we experienced in 19 will replicate in 20. Okay. So I'm being conservative. We're only talking about $60,000 difference. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm not sneering at 60000 but that's not going to solve my problem. Okay. I was hoping that it would. No, but I appreciate <laughs> your thought. <laughs> You'd have to have a lot more new growth. So. Okay. Uh, one quick question, Mr. Noble. I, after uh, the selectmen meet on Tuesday and they go over the classification, yes, would it be possible that you give us a, a breakdown as to yes, and we'll absolutely have that for the meeting. Absolutely, okay. yep. If they approve it. I'll be delighted to release it. Okay. The only thing I would ask you to do is some of the employees won't have been informed by the next night because I'm just they're, looking at the they're meeting the numbers. Yeah, the well, number. Sure, be. I'll be able to give you the yeah. number if you want to know by exactly the position. No, uh, I, 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 I don't think. I, I, I was looking for that. I was just looking at the number. Sorry. Yes, I I'll be answer. able to give you the number, and I don't think it's. <clears throat> I mean, I'm just speculating on what the number is. Not out of line. Not right. tragic. Not not alarming. But um, it's definitely going to be a shift. Yeah, but it's not as big as you think. I'm some concern in the community that that's going to be a big number. Well, here's the, the, the concern I have about the perception. And perception's a reality, and we have to deal with the perception. But we've done five contracts this year in town, plus the teachers is, is under negotiation. And so all of these occur in the same year. So you go two years when everybody is basically asleep, nobody's getting a raise, then all of a sudden you have a year and everybody's getting a raise because every collective bargaining agreement is on the table this year. So the community sort of goes wild with so-and-so got a raise, so-and-so got a raise. Because they did, because the collective bargaining agreement expired and it was renegotiated and there are raises. So when we have raised all of the collective bargaining agreements then you have to look at the department heads if you raise the troops the sergeants want more too so right now we've been doing a cola that matches or is similar to what the unions have been experiencing in getting uh, on, on a year-to-year -year basis and that's fine well when we renegotiated the contracts the unions did a little better than cola so, of course, the sergeants want to be treated equally. So the concern I have is that 
the perception is everybody's getting a raise. Well, the collective bargaining agreements, which cover 88% of town employees, every one of those 88 is getting a raise because of the collective bargaining agreement, which were timed to all expire in the same year. If you don't want that to happen, we'll change the contract so they expire out of sync. But then <clears throat> every year somebody's going to get a raise as opposed to every third year. So uh, I think the perception is a little bit of out of line with the reality. The reality is it's been three years since the collective bargaining agreement was <coughs> last negotiated. Now they're on the table, they're being negotiated. And look around, the economy is way different than it was three years ago. And the unions aren't foolish, they have been looking and they are able to see. So they're asking for more. I think it's very helpful that that explanation comes out, you know, at meetings like, like this and that the uh, you know, television audience has an opportunity to view that and digest it because a lot of folks, uh, they just look at the number, they don't look like uh, in the case of the building commissioner, that's right. the additional duties, you know, that's, they don't have any access to that type of uh, information. So they see that, that one number and it's, it's startling right. for them. But once you justify it, then it makes a lot right. of sense. So I, you know, I the more I dialogue that we have along those lines, I think. But I hadn't stepped up to the plate and, and made sure that we compensated the employee for the job he was doing, we would have lost that employee. And I can point to specific things that have occurred only because he has been here. And oh, I, I agree. I think right. he's done a fabulous job. <clears throat> we just, we, you know, we see where we got a, a grant coming for about a quarter of a million dollars that we're going to spend on uh, redoing the lighting fixtures in one of the schools. And that will save us ongoing forever because we're going to switch from the, um, losing my mind, from the fluorescent tubes to the LEDs like we have here. Um, they're going to also go to the concept where the lights will turn off when nobody's in a classroom. Um, the lights will also not flicker, which has caused some problems in classrooms because they're not fluorescent. They're on, they're off, they're LED. Um, so we're going to save, we save money in the sense we got a grant to do all the conversion. We're saving money because once the conversion is done, we will not be using as much electricity. You add that up over and over again with Jim with everything he's done um, and the creativity he has employed. And you look at the street lights that we replaced where the budget had been 60,000 and we're barely at 30,000 now. So all of these things are happening because of him getting the grant, writing the proposal and executing the plan. And it's a full-time job. In addition, he's the building commissioner. Right. So um, he's here at really odd hours and he takes work home. So we're getting more than our money's worth. My, my question on that, that issue there was basically because I'm concerned about usurping the legislative branch of the town, which is, you know, basically the town meeting and, and what they and what the voters intent at the town meeting uh, to have done. And, and, in, in, uh, in the well, I would argue that the intent of so meeting voters was to run the town and here's the money to do it. I don't think when a town meeting is, is in session that they're worried about Sergeant so-and-so getting a dollar or, you know, I think they're looking at the grand budget total and saying, to, can we run the town? Can we deliver the services? Can the roads get plowed and paved? And does the sewer flow? I think that's what they're voting. I'm not well, sure necessarily I, they're voting right the, down. Their the question line. would be, well, where, yeah, where is the money to pay for it? And when, and then the following year, um, when you've reached your two and a half levy, and there's no more money, but yet you, the legis the administrative branch, has voted salary increases. Either you're going to face a situation of raising your two and a half levy in order to cover the raises. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be a big question. And, and then town meeting members, are, if I'm second guessing them, are going to say, well, wait a minute, we never pro, pro, you know, voted to have all these increases take place. So why are you asking us for an, a, a two and a half override? 
Well, and that's what you're going to be facing. You know, there's just so much money in the I mean, plot, and we, we all know that. John, when's the last time the town did a two and a half override? Well, I don't think we've, we've other than so the, why do other you anticipate school, that there's going to be well tomorrow. I'm just saying. Sooner or so later, far, so far that we have balanced the budget within the parameters of two and a half. Okay. In addition, the headcount on the town side of government is down four. So we have less employees doing the same amount of work. I'm not. I'm seeing as we all are that Chapter 70 is not going to be increased. Correct. I don't see the the, the state legislature or the governor. For a t for the towns of this size and 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 the and the demographics of which go into the chapter, are we going to see any increases? If we keep ex if we if you don't manage your budget, you will definitely okay. be in trouble. And you have only two and a half budget. increase in all your rece your local receipts. Yeah. Um, but you increase your budget more. Than the two and a half, and two, and your, and, uh, and your state revenues. Sooner or later, you're going to reach a breaking point. If you're irresponsible in the management of your budget, you will absolutely reach that point. Well, the question is, being responsible is a very relative term, and uh, so I, I would. I think we've demonstrated responsibility in the last three, two years, two budget cycles. And I think that we've delivered a much more well, I'm, transparent I'm, I'm not budget. Questioning, so. I'm questioning. I'm questioning where we're looking at uh, the, the future, and we're looking at the expenditures that that are, that are now being made that go f that go beyond, uh, you know, uh, you know, seeing light items, you know, a budget, you know, a certain department budget going up thirty percent. Well, how can we sustain those type of of of, of, of expend expenditures without? Uh, exceeding the two and a half le a levy, that, it, that, that, that's yeah. that's a philosophical question that we're all we're all, we're all facing. It's it's an issue that we're going to have to manage. No question about it. But some of our changes, uh, things that we need to change or things that we have to service, are dictated by the DEP, by the Department of Education, um, by state law or mandate, and sometimes I don't have a choice about what things cost. I don't have a choice about what New Bedford charges us for sewer and water. Um, I don't, I, 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 we, we see uh, what's required in the school for transportation for special education, for McKinney Vento for the home, you know, the, the homeless relocation. Those are not optional spending and they are going up in excess of two and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the direct answer to the question is, when those go up, what can you trim? Now, I think that the more important question is what can, where can you bring efficiencies? And we have brought efficiencies in the, in the last few years. We've cut our property and casualty insurance while expanding our coverage. We have renegotiated our health insurance, not once, twice. So I think that we're looking uh, at, at all of the areas of our operation for increased efficiency. And we've cut our headcount uh, permanently by three and we'll be going right now at four we have to replace one um, so consequently the the answer is you have to manage within the parameters I have and within the money I have which is why you're gonna have to make some hard choices about what you could live without in this budget <laughs> and for example you spoke very very last week when we were at the schools you were you were understanding of their needs and supportive Yes. Great. That's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than I got. Where are you going to get it? Are that, you that was a question. That we that, need a two that and a half override see, because that was one hundred fifty thousand. Okay. So say for example, I think uh, the increases in the budget, and I was uh, uh, pointing that out last week. Yeah. Were primarily due to new students coming in. It was not, you know, the the. Am I correct? Predominantly, I agree with you. Okay. That in special education. So therefore, therefore, we have to have them economize and trim the budget because they have new students coming in. John, it comes down to it's still one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So what are they? What, what is? And that means what the increase is above two and a half percent. No, but what they have to do? Eat the increase? 
They have to manage their budget. That means they have to make cuts in other areas of the quality of instruction in order to make up because because we have new students coming in. Now, if if the population was static, right, and there was a, a, a major increase, I would think that your point would be well taken. But certainly, it's not well taken when when in turn you have new growth coming in and I was raising that point about Fine. we have two hundred and twenty thousand dollars so in I, new growth that but then you have to set as you say okay. you have to set priorities now if you really get me going if you want to say set priorities are you basically now then all of a sudden we're, you're coming up with a wage classification study yes. and now we're going to increase administrative salaries but yet, on the other hand, we don't have enough money, and we're going to have to cut the quality of, of instruction of our children. Is that what you're saying to me? Cops cost money. Fire no, no, costs but uh, money. it's basically what it's basically what you're School driving. Teachers at. cost money. Uh, Are you account? suggesting that we should cheat our employees? I'm, I'm not saying Is that. Is that your suggestion that we should pay our employees less than they are worth? I'm not suggesting that. But I'm saying I'm not. I'm talking about excessive. But, but John, I think th the point is, is we need to deliver a balanced budget. So we need to figure out a way. Correct. To, it's not one department that bears the burden of all. It needs to be shared. We need to figure that part out. And so I, I think everybody's in agreement that we need to figure this this part out. But no, unfortunately, no one department is exempt from needing to, to, to tighten the belt. Right. I, 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 I think. And my I kids think, are I in think school, he's cherry picking. So I'm the last person that would want a bad school. Well, the, we I'm need not to denying. I balance. think he's, I I'm think he's sure cherry picking denying. on an issue, which I supported in trying to understand yeah, yeah. that the, the increase yeah. in the school budget primarily I, was yeah. due to new students. It was not due to yeah. quote. Uh, Trying to but, increase yeah, costs to, yeah. you and, know, and I think every department's going to uh, have. And I think you know, and that, that's why I'm taking argument. exception to yeah. that type of yeah. discussion. I, I think we need to figure out. We're going. We this is the time where we need to. We're going to have to make some difficult decisions. And if we could, we would give everybody what they need because everybody needs more money than what we have to give. But we can't do that. We have to figure out a way. And I think that's all it is. Right. I think we, we need to figure that part out. But for, I don't think. Me personally, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but nobody is exempt from having to tighten the belt here, you know. So I think that's 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 where we're at. So we need to we need to figure. We're not going to solve anything between the two of you going back and forth. No, no. Uh, we, we, need to, to, we need to move on. I think the point I think the point was well taken. But I think the point is I'm trying to raise some red flags, yeah. okay, in, in our deliberations, and, and I'm and I'm trying to say that whether whether. I don't care who, you know, the, the, the person, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to personalize it, but when we look at major increases that the yeah. town meeting has not supported, yeah. I, 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 th I think, I think there's a question of, a, a, in my estimation, uh, of abuse of power. Simply that. Okay, thank you. You got me going. I think Mr. Howcroft made some valid points, and I think Brian also makes some valid points, yeah. but at the end of the day, we're going to have to look at it as a whole. And come to an agreement. Yeah. You know. Yeah, when we, when we look at these numbers, you know, I mean, it's shocking because you look at the deficit of sure. more than three quarters of a million dollars right off the top. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, that's that's a lot. Yeah, eight hundred twenty-seven thousand. <coughs> the, the, the deficit, that's the deficit that you mentioned, the eight hundred twenty-six thousand. Yeah. That doesn't include the two hundred two thousand dollars in articles that aren't going to be covered by free cash. An overlay surplus, assuming we approved all the articles. So yeah. the deficit's really like around a million. You, you really want to, yeah, I mean, you really want to pull this in perspective. We asked departments to, to give us what they want, okay, and justify the need. And then it's this committee that determines what the priority will be. Not everything in the capital budget is going to survive that process. So once we decide what our priorities are, then we'll know where we have to come up with the money. I am not concerned in the capital items uh, at the moment. I think I can give you the priorities, or I think we can work through the priorities that will keep us within due bounds on our capital budget. I'm not really worried about that. I am a little concerned with our operational budget. And this comes down to the point about pairing revenues with like sources, so the matching principle where I'm matching an ongoing expense with an ongoing revenue, 
and a one-time expense with a one-time revenue. The debate will come what's a recurring revenue and what's a non-recurring revenue. We project our, our uh, revenue conservatively. We do so so that in the middle of the year we don't have cuts and we don't have a problem. Um, that's good financial management. Nobody disputes the need for police officers, school teachers, um, firefighters, etc. Um, we don't dispute that need. What the question is, is how to afford these things. Not if, but how. So nobody says that we shouldn't educate our children, and nobody says that the fire department shouldn't show up at your house. What we're trying to figure out is what is the correct balance. And like school teachers, and firemen, and policemen, and town hall employees, they expect a fair wage for a fair work. We are in competition for employees, good employees. If you don't keep up with the competition, we'll have the employees that can't go somewhere else, and then you'll be unhappy with their productivity. So we have to stay, we have to stay in the market. Which one of us is willing to work at below the market rate? None. So, other, you know, other than perhaps a Catholic priest who takes a vow of poverty, the rest of us go to work to earn money. And most of us are, are paid for the work we do at a fair wage. Same is true with the town. And that's what collective bargaining agreements establish. And in the case of the non-union employees, that's what the wage of classification is to establish. The wage of classification studied how we are competitively against our peer group and our neighbors. Because our competition is, if I don't work here, I work next door. I'd like to keep good employees by paying them fairly. Not overpaying them, but also not underpaying them. I, th I, I think what makes this challenging to a certain degree as well is if you take a, a business in the private sector and their revenues stay the same year over year for three years, um, salaries are not going to increase because well, they can't have raises. Yeah, and you're going to have layoffs. However, in the minute in the the public sectors may not grow significantly, but the raises continue to escalate, and that's I think true. But I can't market to increase my sales. Okay. If I want to increase my sales, I market, I come up with a better product, I build the better mousetrap. In town government, all I can do well, is increase pay efficiency. For marketing and advertising True. Too. But here in town town government, we increase our efficiency. Or we bid out our product to see if we can get the better a better deal on the products we have to buy. Hence we have to bid out police cruisers, although that's probably a very bad example. Um, but bid out our health insurance, our property and casualty insurance, our office products, etc. Uh, we bid out school books, we bid out fuel oil, we bid out everything we possibly can to achieve the greatest efficiency in the purchases. So you're right, there is a limit in all things. And the demand for services continue to rise in, in the public sector, you know. There is no day that goes by that I don't get a call about a pothole, a street light, a need for uh, more police coverage, a road repair, um, a sewer Speed repair, correct. So, and those services still have to be delivered. Trash pickup. Trash pickup. Yeah, that's the challenge, is how do you pay for it long term when you're not going to get enough revenue from the state, you know? The state doesn't share well in the sandbox, um, but they've been doing better in the last couple of years, but they're now, like the education reform, I was sort of hoping we would pick up some money there. Um, but they're, they're not, it's not aimed at us. It's, it's not aimed at, you know, it's more like the city of Boston, um, Somerville, the western communities that are experiencing um, population loss, but still their fixed costs are higher. So the rural transportation is increasing, but we're not, we're not getting that. But when they roll that out, the expectation was that, you know, we're going to give the you know, The expectation was certainly there. I couldn't wait right. to open the, the sheet and see what we would potentially get. 
and I was disappointed. Right. Um, we get the minimum twenty bucks a pupil or something like that. Right. You know, I mean that's correct. Considering the cost, I mean that's negligible. But, uh, yep. So, back to your point that the state revenues don't keep up with uh, no the increase of uh, the expenses and the demands that they put on the uh, correct on the communities. And I don't want. I mean, no one relishes. I don't know anybody who thinks their tax bill is too small. Really? Not, well, everybody I talk to thinks their taxes are too high. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, nobody comes into town hall and says, I'd like to make a contribution because my taxes are too low. So we have to be very, very careful. Every time there's a, just chatting, a gubernatorial candidate comes to New Bedford statewide, I always ask the question, I say, how are you going to help the property uh, Ta you know, taxpayer uh, in a town similar to a cushion. Are yeah. uh, you going to channel some more money into local aid that's going to alleviate some of the cost? And they look at me as though we got two heads. <laughs> so, I mean, so I, I just want to say, I, I, you I know really, where we're yeah. headed. On, on I, I get an awful lot of. Um, but I ask the question each time. The town I, should run more like I, a business. Well, if the town should run a little bit more like a business, then I should have. Uh, the ability to procure without the paperwork quicker. Um, I should not have to have uh, archaic employment rules. Um, I should be able to, if I'm mandated by the state to perform a certain service, I should expect full reimbursement from the state to do that service. So when I run like a business, when the state lets me. And if you want some real reform, I would really like the pension reform to happen so that we could solve the OPEP problem. And those problems aren't going to be taken care of here on a Kushnet Hill. They're going to be taken care of on Beacon Hill. And until that changes, I have a mandate. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know who thought it was a good idea that town employees should not participate in Social Security and, uh, and we should provide a mandatory requirement to go to the county retirement fund that a town cannot create its own retirement fund and fund it at a certain rate, but the state dictates what it will be. To me, a business doesn't have that dictation. That's a competitive factor. All right. Any discussion on this topic? Oh. Can we table it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on with the agenda. Uh, whole business, I think that's pretty much been discussed. New business, uh, Ms. Flint was here earlier and uh, they'd like to uh, meet with the committee again, so we'll tentatively schedule that in two weeks uh, for an uh, update on the school department budget. <coughs> so you can bring to them what you've heard here. <laughs> they've, cut, they've cut, what, 250000 off the budget? What is it, 727,000, right? <laughs> yeah. No, unfortunately not. We have some additional costs that we need to at least apprise you of, so. Okay, uh, meeting minutes. We have the approval for January 30th of 2019. Absent was uh, Jackie Stanley, Sue Delgado, and uh, Mike Boucher. Thank you, motion. Second. Motion made, second to accept. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So accepted. And on February 6th, uh, absent was Susan and Jackie again. So Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Well, I want to thank everybody. It was an interesting dialogue that we had this evening, but I think it needs to get out. I think it needs to get out in the public because, and I base that on the questions that I get asked outside of the meeting um, from different townspeople at the coffee shops, at the, especially at the ball games, uh, at, the, at the schools. And so it's, uh, I think it's healthy that, that people get, you know, uh, an insight as to what goes on to, to balance a budget and, and the challenges that, that face the town administrator, the, the 
department heads as well as the finance committee. So, that being said, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned.